Hello and welcome to Second Draft's podcast, everything you need to write, edit, and publish your way. I'm Jeremy. And I'm EJ. And today on Second Draft, we'll be continuing where we left off uh, in the last podcast, and we're going to be talking about uh, what we've been watching uh, recently and what we think of them from, of course, a writing standpoint. Uh, So we're going to basically talk about TV there. Uh, so, Ethan, uh, what have you been watching recently? Yeah, uh, most recently, uh, well, let me put it this way, a while ago we started uh, catching up on a slightly older series, it's called The Hundred, I'm not sure if you if you know about it or have seen it. Yeah, I've heard about it, uh, my spouse has uh, really gotten enthralled with it as well there. I never really got into it though. Hmm, not... <laughs> you know what bugged it about what bugged you about it? Uh well I think I watched the first two. I didn't really have any real complaints about it. Just uh it seemed a little corny to me, some parts of it. <laughs> like uh I think I got up to like maybe episode three or four and there was like the mutants that started coming in. Oh yeah. And that kinda I don't know, just turned me off a little bit. Never really gripped me. Like some okay. other series have. So oh, fair know. enough. Uh, strange you should say that because uh, I think I've also only progressed to about episode four or five. Okay. Look, it's, it's not that it's bad. It's 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 an interesting concept, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, nuclear war wipes everyone out. Only the survivors are on this uh, orbiting space station. Interesting concept. Um, sending the prisoners back. Um, nice little uh, sci-fi series, but yeah, I must say they it, it, it's interesting enough. It's um, they're very good with passing out information, you know, having these little se- lots of secrets that they get to reveal. Like at the end of the episode, they do cliffhangers really well. Mm-hmm. Um, but aside from that, yes, I must admit maybe f- something went missing a bit. In uh, <laughs> from concept that's so interesting and gripping to execution, I'm not sure what it is myself, but maybe at some point in the future I'll continue with it to see whether I can get back into it. But for right now, pretty much like you. Well, I mean, also the the title kind of goes out the window after a little bit too, doesn't it? Like <laughs> there's supposed to be only those those people, the hundreds, yeah. and then more people keep coming down. Yeah, so it, yeah, it does. It's a bit just like a launch pad, conceptual launch pad for the series, and then yeah, just keeps changing. <laughs> but what I like about it is the a bit of the politics about uh, in the in the space station as well. You know, just how it is up there. You've got this extremely limited resources and air and food and whatever, and it's just it's quite. I like stories that have that. You know, this scarcity that people have to overcome and I'm I'm guessing that's part of why I'm going to be enjoying the Martian as well. Yeah. But uh <laughs> yeah, exactly. The one episode where you don't mention it then I'm the one who mentions it. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Well like yeah with the hundred that I think was the most interesting part that I found of it it was the space station side of things and then I found out that it kinda they all come down after a little mm-hmm. bit. And so that kind of turned me off a little bit too, as well, because like I, I found that side of things really uh, compelling. Uh, I'm more like when I like uh, sci-fi, I like it to be purely sci-fi. I like yeah, actually, <laughs> out space. in space and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, sci-fi without space kind of loses something, definitely. <laughs> so, what about you? Have you had any interesting shows recently, or anything you want to talk about? Uh, recently, uh, me and my spouse have been rewatching The Office. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, the whole series is on Netflix there, so it makes it uh, a lot easier to watch when you can just nice. pick up and play it. Uh, but it's just interesting uh, watching something from start to finish like that, like mm-hmm. just kind of binge watching it. You see a lot of uh, things that you might not necessarily... 
uh, pick up on the first time through. Oh, yeah, of course. So there's like lots of recurring jokes and uh, the characters are really done well. Like, uh, for instance, uh, you, you've you seen The Office, I'm sure. Uh, yeah, I've seen one or two stray episodes, but okay. uh, shame to admit I haven't seen seen it. Well, are you familiar with the character uh, mm. Dwight? Yeah. So Dwight is uh, almost like the enemy of the main characters there, mm -hmm. but uh, he is a farmer and very serious type character and almost kind of nerdy, uh, but he owns a, a beet farm, and his family has very strange customs and stuff like that, so they always, like every once in a while, bring that up, so... Like, uh, there's, like, early on you hear about his cousin, Mose, and how weird he is, and you just see him coming back in later episodes and uh, other stuff like that. Like, uh, there's a Christmas episode where it was, uh, like, his family's tradition of Christmas, and it was, like, a German Christmas, and it actually... Uh, related to uh, an old German tradition. So it was okay. uh, very interesting just building that character and uh, seeing him kind of change and you learn more about him as it goes along. Okay. And like uh, another thing uh, that they start early on, there's the series is set in Scranton mm -hmm. uh, in the U.S., uh, so there's this person, uh, serial murderer called the Str Scranton Strangler. Okay. And they keep bringing him up throughout the series, and then eventually it uh, culminates in one of the characters uh, having jury duty on <laughs> his trial. And like that kind of went on for several seasons before, and then that uh, trial came up, and then kind of just built on it, and it's... Uh, very interesting and uh, good writing uh, that comes out of that, uh, really knowing the characters. And, like, there's other examples of shows that kind of don't do it as well, like The Simpsons. You kind of, like, after a while with The system, Simpsons, you kind of notice that they rehash old things mm -hmm. or they, uh, certain aspects of the characters are uh washed over with other um other episodes so yeah. kind of the things kind of don't go in a continuity almost yeah, so it's yeah. interesting to see when it's done very well like like the office oh. no that's that's cool the office is kind of uh legendary among some of those shows with like their running gags yeah things like that so uh, definitely makes me more keen to want to watch it sometime yeah and you almost got to wonder like uh how they do it sometimes too because like it's when you binge watch it it seems very natural but when you're actually doing i'd say the writing side of things it's done in those seasons or the off seasons mm. so uh you gotta just wonder like do they go back and like, look at some of their old episodes and then, like, oh, we should bring up this again, type thing. Mm. Yeah, you kind of wonder, do they look back or do they look forward? Do they yeah. plan it all ahead? Well, one seems a bit more difficult than the other. <laughs> Very interesting just to think about from a writing standpoint, I feel. Mm. Yeah, so, I, I suppose that can give a lot of... Uh, uh, ideas for, you know, when you want to foreshadow things in your own uh, fiction. That's quite an important part of it, I think. Yeah. Learning how to foreshadow well, I think, can that, that kind of, that skill can make or break a story. Mm -hmm. Which is, you know, that's, that's good. So what about you there? Anything else that you've been watching recently? Um, hmm, aside from that, I've been watching a bit of Extant. I don't know, do you know the series? It's with, uh, Halle Berry? Uh, no, I'm not familiar with it. Like, I haven't watched it. But uh, I don't mean to burst your bubble there too soon, but I actually heard that it was cancelled. <gasps> no, it's not. Are you serious? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just I just read it recently. After the second season, I'm guessing. 
Yeah. Which is uh, such a shame because is the second season uh, ongoing right now. Yeah, it's well, it is for us in South Africa. I'm not completely sure how completely up to date that is, but I don't think we get it much later than 24 hours after the US. Okay. So I think the second season is pretty much in its last third at the moment. That's a pity <laughs> because uh, I was I was about to say this series. You know, the first season I was very excited for it when I saw the previews and I watched the first season and uh, it was slightly underwhelming. I wasn't completely blown away by it, but you know I, I liked it enough so that when the second season rolled around, I thought, oh, okay, you know, let's watch it again, the second season, see what happens. And the second um, season of it is actually quite a bit better, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, than the first, <laughs> which which surprises me now because if the first one earned them a second season, how can the second season not have earned them a third one? It's yeah. crazy. Uh, well, and also, is... I didn't even know that uh, Halle Berry was in it. That's kind of a big star power, and for it to be cancelled, that's kind of strange. Yeah, that That is. Oh, I'll have to read up on what happened there. But for this, I mean, for the second season... The pacing is slightly sh- slower, I think, than the average TV series, which, now that I think about it, might have something to do with it. In the second the season or the first season? In, in, in the second season. Well, the first was also quite slow. The second okay. is uh, a bit faster, I would say, but still not as you know fast as something like Heroes was or uh, one of those, Breaking mm-hmm. Bad even. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it gains a lot of momentum as the, as the season goes on, and you've got this... Even though it's, uh, it's, it's kind of a slow progression, it's still this, this, this looming sense of dread that you get. It really builds up the suspense as this, uh, you know, this humanics program, which are these robots, uh, kind of gain, well, more like androids, I should say. Uh, they start gaining more and more power and getting, becoming more dangerous and starting to go off the rails a bit. It's quite, it's very interesting, I must say. And, uh, one thing that I just, this season kind of uses flash forwards a bit. You know, mm-hmm. Halle Berry gets this vision about some character's death, and then you know they kind of they use that well. But I must say one thing: it's kind of war on me after a while because they they start reminding you of this every ten minutes, maybe or fifteen <laughs> minutes. It feels like, and by the end, you know, you get to the end of an episode, you're like, man, did, did they just remind us five, four, or five times during this episode of that flash of that vision she had? Because that's too much. It gets to be a little bit too much. <laughs> Almost <laughs> but, seems uh, like uh, my complaint of uh, Wheel of Time. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Can be so, a little but, overbearing. Got to get that balance right. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Maybe, well, look, all of this might have contributed to get the show cancelled. That's such a pity. <laughs> <laughs> so, you mentioned there about uh, androids or robots. Uh, oh, yeah. So that... Is a very uh, tropey type um, idea. How does um, Extant differ? Hmm. In the androids, let me see. Okay. Look, it's not quite like Cylons from Battlestar Galactica. They're not completely. <laughs> <laughs> the Cylons were cool. I'll give them that. But um, these androids. Hmm, I'm not sure actually. They're they're exactly like humans. They've got you know they look like humans. They've got. Uh, well, I more so skin mean and like from a, a writing standpoint, like uh, how oh, does yeah. it differentiate itself from all the other ones that have done that kind of uh, uh, robots rising mm-hmm. up type thing. Um, in this one, the robots are they're built by the good guys in order to try to prevent an alien invasion kind of okay. thing. So the robots are meant to be used for good and in general they are. And one of the primary, the, the, the protagonist, Halle Berry, her child is actually one of these robots. She adopted him when they were testing him in the beta phase. So, and this little boy's name is Ethan by chance. <laughs> <laughs> and so you've actually got one of your main characters in the story, your main protagonists as well, that you will root for is one of these humanics robots. So I think that's kind of different. Um, for yeah, him, that does seem interesting. Yeah, so even while the robots are rising up and his 
sister, you might say. She was also adopted by some of these scientists to kind of, uh, you know, she was the first one. Uh, so you've got Ethan and his sister, Lucy. And Ethan tends to be more on the side of the humans because he was raised by them. His morality is not determined by coding, but mm -hmm. by having been raised by humans. Or you know, And Lucy, on the other hand, they had to rush her uh, construction and her programming. They didn't get time to have her generate her morality by itself, so they had to code it. So you could say corners were cut with her. <laughs> they were rushed because there was this alien invasion. Yeah. And due to that, you kind of see Lucy become this little manipulator. She completely manipulates every situation to her advantage, which is very creepy to see. So, yeah, <laughs> I so like that type of character. Mm, yeah, definitely. It's, it, it is worth a watch. And uh, I th So I think what makes this different is that, you know, you don't just have the robots there and, oh, they're going to... the androids, they're going to rise up and it's dangerous. You actually have a, quite a human perspective on it. And... So the Ethan and Lucy, are they like, uh, like supposed to be a little boy and a little girl, or are they like adult? Well, features? Ethan is a little boy. He's like about, let's say, 10 or 11. And Lucy's a bit older. She's a, like a teenager, maybe 18, 19. Okay. So, yeah, so they differ quite a bit. And uh, But Lucy, for instance, she's a very complex character, I would say, because there was this one episode where they were talking to her about, oh, but they've coded it into her. She has to die at some point. Because that's how they, they planned the human egg. And she said, oh, but, you know, I don't have to die. I'm not a human. And she said it this so forcefully. And then in another episode later, they said, well, here's a chip that can make you feel more like a human. And instead of again saying, oh, but I'm not a human, she actually accept, accepted the chip. Which shows that she's quite conflicted and she's quite a complex character, I think. Uh, she would like to say that she's nothing like humans. But when given the chance to feel more like a human, she actually takes it, which is... Hmm, so it's almost kind of like... Um, I can't remember the movie it was called there, but uh, do robots dream of electric sheep? What oh, was yeah. the movie there? Was that AI? No, no, no. Was it? No, not AI. I'm going to have to look it oh. up now. <laughs> there it is. Uh, or androids do androids dream of electric sheep what was the movie probably we're gonna be like don't don't be uh uh don't be mean to us in the comments there <laughs> i know <laughs> i know how big this movie is to some people uh blade runner that's what it was oh of course oh how did we miss that blade seems, runner yeah seems it like is it's a bit. taking a little homage from that <laughs> Definitely, yeah. With the uh, Lucy being a uh, limited lifespan there. Yeah, yeah. No, definitely. It's, it's, but uh, unlike there, I don't think there's much of a mystery around who these are. Not that's more Battlestar Galactica's purview. <laughs> but uh, yeah, definitely. Um, that's too bad. I, of... uh, I, uh, I'm kind of interested in that now. I like. <laughs> that kind of sci-fi aspect, like yeah. I like the androids and stuff like that. Yeah. That's too well, bad I mean, that it was cancelled. Yeah, I'd, I'd strongly recommend. I mean, take a look, muscle through the first season <laughs> if you can, and then the second season is quite awesome. Maybe Netflix will pick it up because that's happened with a couple. Ah, uh, that that would be nice. <laughs> <laughs> but then, yeah, speaking of uh, movies being tied to series, I think you've got one of those that you wanted to mention yeah i've been watching uh the limitless tv series uh, have you seen the movie I'd... i have seen the movie quite a while ago okay the one with uh, bradley cooper right? yeah. Oh, yeah so that's definitely interesting uh just even from a writing standpoint trying to take that movie and turn it into a series because it's not uh it's not a remake it's it's a continuation. Oh, yeah. Like so, a sequel-ish thing. Yeah. So uh, the character that Bradley Cooper plays from the movie is actually uh, in the series, and he makes a couple of appearances. So I think he's in the he's in the first episode and mentioned throughout the other ones, and then I think the upcoming he's going to be in episode six again. So he's... Uh, He's kind of uh, 
doing a little bit more TV as well himself, just on the uh, uh, Wet Hot American Summer. He was in that too. Huh? Just kind of working through his uh, other schedules with his movies and everything to kind of appear in there. Uh, but as far as the series, it it does tie in uh, to the movie and it does uh, kind of do some of the direction uh, of it, like the the different camera pans and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And uh, like when he, like the whole story is, if nobody has watched it, uh, there's this pill that essentially makes you super intelligent. It makes your brain uh, super efficient, but there are the side effects. So uh, Bradley Cooper's character in the initial movie uh, was taking it there, and stuff happens, of course. <laughs> of course. And eventually, uh, by the end, spoilers, you might want to skip the next two minutes if you want to watch that movie. But uh, eventually he does uh, find a cure for the side effects. So he can keep taking the drug and continue on. And like uh, at the end it shows him trying to become a senator. And so this is kind of a continuation of that. Bradley Cooper's character, uh, he gives that cure to the main character of the series. Okay. So that kind of is how it ties in there a little bit. And uh, when they take the pill, like what I was mentioning before with the direction, uh, when they take the pill, uh, everything becomes uh, really color saturated. So oh, yeah? beforehand, it's really kind of dull and whatnot. But then afterwards, it's like it's more brighter. It's red. Like the reds are kind of intensified. So you that. Even see that in the poster for the movie, it's a very distinct. <laughs> style that they used for it yeah and that continued on with the series so like a lot of different things like that uh, so if you're a fan of the movie you're definitely going to be a fan of the series uh, but after the first episode it kind of turns into uh, that cop drama like a serial uh, CSI type okay. thing so that might not be everyone's uh, bag, as it were. <laughs> okay. But uh, does it, you say cop serial, so is it, um, how is it in terms of repetition? You know how, like, you get different kinds of series, like something like Castle. Is every episode is essentially the same, just the details different. Yeah. You know, they, they get a new case each time. And where other series like Extant, for instance, or The 100, it keeps progressing. It's not really re- repetitive how is this limitless series in that sense yeah i'd say that it unfortunately does take a few of those bad tropes from those uh cop drama ones where the it's kind of the the uh murder of the week as it were Uh, the thing that uh i think is really interesting is the the other aspect with uh bradley cooper's character and the things that are going on there. So, like, there's kind of tidbits that are going on uh, with that side of things that get filtered in. That's the more interesting thing that I uh, I like about it. So, like, for instance, he needs that uh, the cure every so often so that he doesn't get the bad side effects of the drug. So uh, Bradley Cooper's character and his entourage, as it were, are kind of forcing the main character to do things for him. Oh, of course. Ransoming the cure. Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> so that side of things is really interesting, but it's kind of few and far between. And uh, as far as the cop drama side of things, it seems like the pacing for that side is not that great. It really jumps around quite a bit, and it's a little hard to follow. It's... It's definitely uh, not like uh, True Detective Season 2, where that just is all over the place. (laughs) It's not like that, at least, but it is still a little hard to follow. Um, It might be on purpose, because he's supposed to be Mm. super intelligent. Okay, so it might be a meta-statement about the whole thing, but... (laughs) Yeah, like, oh, he's hard to follow because it's it's his intelligence type thing, but... Mm. 
kind of remains. She doesn't to... sound completely convinced of that. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> like, uh, I don't mean to jump into another series I've been watching there, but on the opposite end of things for like that cop drama, I've been watching uh, I Zombie. Oh yeah, and the pacing for that is just perfect. Like you could, you could miss a couple minutes and you'd still know what's going on. And uh, on that end of things, like it's kind of a zombie-ish thing, but it turns it on its head and uh, turns it into that cop drama type thing. So, like the main character turns into a zombie, but not full zombie. So she needs the brains to like keep her human side, but she also gets these visions of the people who died. So like she can kind of uh, piece together um, the murder mystery aspect through those visions and helps a cop while doing that. And, uh, Sounds a bit like a like a bit like a vampire. Some vampires have been of the kind where they have to keep drinking you know some blood to stay kind of human and they become more and more starved and uh, as long as they go without blood so in this case it seems a bit like warm bodies where she what does she get the visions from from not from eating brains though, right yeah <laughs> oh really that is oh. it yeah she so, eat, does she eat the brains of the victims yeah so she oh no <laughs> she works in a morgue <laughs> And that's oh. how she gets the brains. So okay. when she okay. eats them, she kind of gets those visions, but also almost like the ah. emotional aspect of that person. So if that person was like a paranoid kind of person, she'll become paranoid. Oh, wow. Well, for the rest of the episode kind of thing. Yeah. So oh. it, it it makes it interesting in that aspect as well. Like it, it's really different from the regular um cop drama side of things and unlike with limitless again uh, it has a, a side story going on between this other character who's a zombie who is kind of the big bad as it were mm -hmm. and it really ties it in very well to the rest of the story uh, whereas limitless it seems very disjointed at the moment okay so almost those two aspects in limitless are very separate uh, the side of uh, Bradley Cooper's character and the main character versus I Zombie and this bad zombie character. Uh, it's very connected to the cop drama side and the on the writing aspect that works really well. And again, the pacing is so good that if you missed a couple minutes, like if you for some reason weren't paying attention, you still won't lose anything you'd be able to keep up okay. yeah that's that's a good way to structure it that's yeah really something <laughs> yeah i'm finding a lot more enjoyment out of i zombie currently than limitless so mm. kind of shows does a little bit look very cool and i see it's based on a comic book so that's cool yeah i think that's going to be quite interesting i definitely have to see that yeah <laughs> I recommend it. It's a, it's a good series. Awesome. So I think you were mentioning uh, Quantico to me before there. Oh, yes, Quantico. That is the other series that I'm watching recently. I think this one is still brand new. It's like on its fourth episode now, I think. Um, yeah, I think I saw some previews there. Wasn't the girl from Heroes in there? Or am I mistaken? Uh, I... Uh, I'm not completely sure. I, I don't think so. Um, I haven't seen this girl before. Let me just see who this is. Um, She's a Priyanka blonde. Chopra. Oh no, no, no. <laughs> There's uh, th there is a blonde in here, but she's uh, not the main character, and she's yeah. Well, um. This is a, a very cool show, as the the name says. It's kind of uh, about the FBI training program mm -hmm. at you know Quantico, <laughs> and uh, it's it follows kind of a you know first year class of new trainees in the FBI, but 
rather than just be, you know, like Harry Potter just for the FBI, you know, just follow the characters through their first year. The show starts off with like a huge, like a terrorist attack that started, and a whole. I think it's a, a huge landmark in New York. I don't want to spoil too much, but a huge <laughs> landmark in New York has been blown up, and this uh, main girl uh, wakes up, you know, right on the perimeter of the blast, and the show just goes from there. And I must say, this the one thing this show does really well is um, uh, subtext and secrets and just revealed all the time. I, I've, I've seen the first three episodes and there are so many secrets that are revealed. Like, you, you can't go five minutes in the show without some kind of secret coming out. It's amazing. <laughs> I have no idea. Because they've even got, they've got a limited cast. Like, I mean, of course, you, you can't have more than like 10 or 15 people in your cast and that, that's about how big their cast is. And you would think, well, you know, that kind of puts enough a limit on how many secrets you can have come out, but apparently not. <laughs> they're, they're bending some of the laws of physics and storytelling, I'm guessing. <laughs> but seriously, this is, they, they just put layers and layers of subtext, so much audience privilege that, that you get to know things that some of the other characters don't know. Mm -hmm. and then later, another secret will be the fact that, oh, well, you know, the, the director of the program in the FBI is actually in on this secret. She knew about this, and that's, you know, another secret that comes up. So it's it's incredibly, and it's also told in two storylines. You know, you've got your present day storyline where the the landmark was blown up, and then you've got your flashbacks to nine months before when the FBI trainees just started out on their first couple of weeks in the program, and it kind of uh, you know something will happen in the present, and then the story will jump back into the past and kind of tell you a bit about and reveal some of the things that you need to know to understand what they're talking about right now. Um, in that sense, it's uh, yeah, it's very interesting, and uh, definitely I can recommend if if you want to learn how to do subtext really well, <laughs> this is the show to watch. Um, definitely, and uh, I mean, in some later tutorials for us, I would like to chat about subtext and how to do it, how to create knowledge gaps, how to maintain yeah. them. Very interesting topic that I'm quite passionate about. But yeah, that's Quantico. <laughs> Do you think that that uh, would easily translate over to books, or uh, would it be more something uh, screenplay? Because when you talk about the audience privilege there with certain characters, obviously with um, TV shows, it jumps around a lot more mm -hmm. so than you can with um, with a book. Like I know. You personally have kind of been trying to beat it into me there over the past couple of books about point of view characters and <laughs> <laughs> that sort of thing. Uh, try not to violate the point of view. Yes, so <laughs> there's there's that, but uh, definitely you can uh, build subtext into a novel as well. It's not just I think screenplay has kind of got the idea from novels that did it really well. Um, look, there's one thing to be in one scene, and in that one scene you kind of want to maintain your point of view. You know, if you choose this character to be the point of view character, then you need to stick to that. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, there's, uh, there are other options, like being omniscient third person, where you kind of float around into different characters' heads, but, uh, you know, that's not typically too much in style nowadays. Mm -hmm. uh, but not only that, I think... Uh, yeah, the, the people tend to prefer more to have a solid point of view anchored in one character's head. But that doesn't mean in different scenes you cannot switch it around and jump to another character and then to another one. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you jump to, let's say, one of the antagonists, which certainly is, is something that many books do, you know, give you a couple of scenes from the antagonist's point of view, right away there you're starting to create audience privilege and knowledge gaps in favor of the audience so that in the end the audience will end up knowing more than your hero. And that always makes for incredibly interesting storytelling. You know, your hero is coming around the corner and you as the audience knows there's a trap but he doesn't know and I mean, what's going to happen? <laughs> so, oftentimes that works much better than just experiencing it with the hero and learning the new things as he does, um, which can still be interesting. But when the audience knows about the trap coming, it kind of it changes a lot of things. <laughs> Do you think that that uh, can 
kind of spoil a surprise, though? Like, do you think that uh, with Quantico, so far, I mean, there's only a couple episodes, but does it spoil any surprise when you know something before anything anyone else does? Well, look, when you do that in your story, certainly then you are aware of what you're doing. So then you balance. You always balance the, the tension of not knowing with the tension of knowing, depending on what it is. Uh, so definitely in Quantico, there are some surprises that they could have kept as surprises, but revealing it was almost pretty much just as interesting, or even more interesting, and trust me, they still have other surprises that you will uh, get, you know, that you will be surprised by eventually. They're not revealing everything, mm -hmm. which is, I think, a good way to play cards, I'm guessing, you know, know what to reveal when, uh, to what effect, and know what to keep back for a big surprise later on. I definitely don't think Quantico is having trouble on that score. <laughs> and maybe sometimes as well, uh, if you do do that kind of style, you have to bring in a different kind of tension. So, like, uh, you don't know whether or not the characters are going to make it through a certain situation, but you know that uh, maybe this other character is against them, so they're not going to help out if they get into a troubling situation, that sort of thing. Would you yeah, agree? Exactly. Exactly, and when when you as the author, when you set it up like that, you will typically drop extra hints to show just how desperately they're going to need this character. And at the same time, you know that the audience knows this character probably won't help them, and that kind of, yeah, that boosts the whole... <laughs> knowing how much of a disaster they're in better than the characters themselves know it. Yeah. That's definitely something readers want, yeah. often. <laughs> Definitely an interesting uh, balance that needs to be made. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And that's that's part of the, the art, I would say. Craft as well, but I think that's part of the the art in, in writing, is knowing your different kinds of tension and being able to uh, insert them and take it away as, as required. Mm -hmm. So, you know, knowing your audience, I think that's, that's a fantastic uh, skill to have. <laughs> Yeah, and especially if you're going to be doing some sort of a murder mystery type thing. <laughs> oh, yes, definitely. <laughs> well, uh, that's all the time that we have there today. So, uh, audience, uh, why don't you let us know what you're watching recently and uh, why you like it, that sort of thing, in the comments. And uh, thank you for joining us here at Second Drafts Podcast. Uh, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on everything you need to write, edit, and publish your way. And let us know what you'd like to see from us in future podcasts. See you next time. All right. Cheers, guys. Do you want to support production of this YouTube series? Visit www.patreon.com slash and become a patron today.